And we're recording. Hello, welcome to the Package Manager Special Interest Group uh, Week Catch Up of Tuesday, the 14th of May, 2019. Uh, yeah, this is um, going to be awesome. So the notes uh, are in the room. Can I please get me into the note? Thank you very much, Ali Zara. Okay, I will uh, go first. Uh, not, uh, what has changed since last week? I'm still doing all the refactoring phase and for wait for all the units of her stuff. Um, that is almost done. It's more almost done than it was done last week, which is cool. Uh, I am going to the DTN conference. On Thursday, so I'll be yeah, the, I I'll be travelling on Thursday, and I'll be at the conference yeah, on Friday. Why? Yeah. Why? 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 That's me. Um, no further updates. Next. Jessica, can you go? My headphones have run out of battery, so I'm. <laughs> sure thing. Um, so. This week, um, so I set up labels for the GitHub project. Um, it is an absurd amount of labels looking through it. If you look at the link, there's like a ridiculous number of them. Um, so part of that was actually sort of as like a proof of concept for how we might want to scale that labeling methodology out to be using on things outside of the package manager world. So um, that was sort of why I was trying to kill a mosquito with a brick there. Um, any any input or thoughts you might have on that are more than welcome. Um, just because part of that, I'm I'm bringing our use of that back to the design guild slash community of practice slash whatever we're calling ourselves now. Um, just as sort of an overarching method for GitHub labeling, since um, seems like as an org we don't really do that all that much or well so far <laughs> i think andrew's got his headset back um so so yeah um i also took a bash at assigning labels to all of our open issues um part of those were pretty straightforward part of that was just me making stuff up so again if um you happen to be sitting in one of those issues um if you don't mind taking a look at the labels just to see if they make sense um and like i said any feedback is more than welcome um so Eric's implementation decision tree um, that Andrew was kind enough to flowchart out, um, I messed about with that a little bit more as well and turned it into really something that was maybe more text-based but was still flowchart-y. That seems to work fairly well. Um, the last box on that, um, the yes and no, the good and bad is sort of switched around. So. Um, uh, if you look at the bottom of that, there's also an alternative box for another way of expressing the same thing. Had an open question out to Eric as to whether that made sense to him. Um, but sort of my intent is this is kind of one of those things that, you know, obviously it's helpful to us to get our thoughts together. But as part of like tying this into Andrew's effort to putting things in a docs directory, um, the more sort of outside world useful we can make any of those artifacts, the better off we're going to be as a whole. Um, this was socializing the package manager's effort. Um, so um, watch that space. I'm going to be sort of, I have that as a background task of really reworking um, as many of those things as we've got in our issues list um, that we feel could be helpful documentation wise um, for the greater community as a whole. Um, Ditto also went through, you know, all those outcomes workshops that we did like in February and March before I worked here and I got to sit in on some of those. Um, I took a stab at um, consolidating that information into, from everybody's conversations, into um, one document that really separates everything out into outcomes, requirements to get to those outcomes, and then ideals. Um, ideals meaning like the entire world uses IPFS for all package managers by default, yay. Um, so that's really a first bash. Um, that's probably gonna inform some additional work just in terms of doing other sort of user journey and segmentation type stuff in the future. Um, it's maybe more of a working document for me and people I might ask questions to than for anything else, anyone else, but it also might be interesting just for you to drop in on that and see how all of those things sort of consolidated from all of our discussions. Yes, Andrew. Uh, that feels like it would be interesting to connect those different blocks you have to like, which docs do we have in the repo and which ones do we not have? Um, yes. And like to give a, a to-do list of things, like yes. there's no details here for uh, publishers. There's only stuff for like 
there's, there's no documentation for that bit person. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think in, especially the requirements section of that mural is going to give us, um, you know, obviously that's going to feed technical requirements, I think, by and large. Um, we are aware of many of those technical requirements, um, having talked about them amongst ourselves, um, but there's also sort of another spin to those requirements, like you're saying, of um, generating requirements for knowledge sharing or outreach or just like general level setting among the community as a whole. So yeah, very, very good point. Um, it's pretty messy right now. There's some duplication in the boxes. Again, it's, you know, it's a working document for me, um, but, it, but it is cool and it might be a good thing just to, you know, make yourself a cup of coffee and glance at it and um, see if it brings up any thoughts. Um, additionally, I also started using um, some of those to generate um, persona documents for our key audience segments. Um, that opened up sort of a rabbit's hole of, um, you know, from, a, from a UX perspective, there's a couple of different ways that you can like do personas and what goes in the sort of information boxes for each persona is going to be very different based on the type of thing that you're building. And I realized, um, you know, sort of standard per persona methodology wasn't going to be real helpful for us. So that's on my list for next week. Um, but that's probably going to detour back into UX strategy toolbox land while I um, figure out some, some best methods for doing personas for product of this nature. Um, next is kind of more of the same. Um, and blockers is just like, I'm, I'm in like moving hell right now. So, um, I am my own worst blocker at the moment. Um, so if I'm sporadic, I, I really apologize in advance. Hopefully this will be all wrapped up by like, at least it, the boxes will be in the new place and kind of unpacked by like the end of next week. So then everything will be back to normal. But, um, if you think it's really bad, you know, <laughs> just like send me DMs on Slack because it pings like my arm. So if you need me in a hurry, you'll find me that way. So <laughs> exactly what Ollie did. I know. I hate this thing. I love it. I hate it. So thanks, guys. Okay. Headphones plugged in. Uh, I can I can hear again. Um, uh, what did I do? So uh, I wrote up a little review of the GitHub package registry that was announced on Friday um, without having beta access, but as far as I can tell, I'm not missing anything, um, and highlighted some of the, the areas that they could do better or that they have done as good as existing package managers uh, in the sense of things can be deleted, uh, there's no connection between the tag of the source code that's released and the thing that's published as a package. As much as some people on Twitter seem to think that that was the case, you can publish anything. Uh, it's literally just push a table, connect it to the release. Uh, it, there's no guarantee of um, anything. I, I should ask for beta access. I did not ask. Uh, the, uh, maybe they were like, we don't give him beta access because they'll find more problems. Uh, then um, there's also like the whole uh, things can be deleted, um, which causes problems. And similarly, like uh, depending on the package manager, the ability to have ambiguous package names coming from different registries, you're essentially trusting every person every GitHub org or user to not make a package called Rails on their own uh, GitHub account, which then puts in a dodgy version of Rails into your gem file because it's not clear how RubyGems would decide which uh, registry it should choose as the priority one for a given package. Similarly with Maven, um, NPM is not affected by that, but... Uh, ongoing um, other integrations will probably run into that same problem. And there, so I, I posted that, uh, it got really good response on Twitter and then GitHub reached out. And I just had a, I just got off a call with them um, kind of to talk about some of those bits more. Uh, and they're kind of, they're, their line is, they don't want to replace package manager registries. Um, there, it's primarily focused on private things to, um, and like GitHub enterprise setups, but they want to work towards 
uh, improving package managers or as a forcing function to make package managers kind of that have got very stale npm for him recently is like the security is is just been disappointing uh, to github and people then blame github for npm's problems uh, and so they're trying to take ownership of that a little bit more and thinking about like ways that they could have um, more reproducibility maybe a github action is the only thing that could be allowed to publish a package or that if a github action published a package without any human interaction it would get more like a verified badge or some like providence trail of here is the the log that shows you what happened to generate that package still potential for some nasty stuff because you could have your github action go and fetch a url from from arbitrary place and insert that inside the package but at least you would have visibility on what happened um if the if the log was actually published somewhere uh they also have some interesting um thoughts on what to do around security of modules potentially blocking downloads of packages that have been classed as being vulnerable which is going to polarize a lot of people's opinions when it comes to open source packages to be like you can no longer download this because it has a security vulnerability whether or not that uh, applies to your particular usage from my pfs point of view that's a um an interesting kind of like opposite stance to if you've already downloaded the package then you should keep the the package like locally uh, and it should continue to work on IPFS. They also want to put on a package manager conference. So I've kind of opted to do uh, a like co-organizer, I guess. Uh, pr no idea of the date. It'll be in San Francisco, most likely in their office for about like 100 people um, and possibly doing a podcast episode with them. They also seem quite open to uh, potential IPFS integration around the package registry. So that might be a case of giving, uh, to, to make the community feel more um, secure in the immutability aspects, uh, as well as adding more layers of um, kind of, uh what's the word i don't know i don't know what the word is but um they seem quite interested in it i basically said i would put together some kind of a doc for them as a primer for the different ways that ipfs could be used or different areas that we could essentially kind of try and align that which would be really interesting i mean we can start with just the releases but potentially having any content from github that it can be content addressable uh, with GitHub running a full suite of IPFS nodes would be um, would be super. Uh, so that's an interesting call um, and I need to follow up. Uh, there's also some stuff that I can't really talk about on the private, on the public call um, that I can save for later. Uh, what else did I do? So I started reorganizing the package manager repo content a little bit. There's a lot of stuff in issues that doesn't, it's good for discussion, but once it's kind of the discussion has died down, then it gets lost in a never ending sea of new issues scrolling past. So I've been plucking the interesting content out into docs. There's a pull request that's open. Um, and like, it's kind of moving towards being almost like a, a book or like a guide um, with like references and reading materials for different areas uh, that my, I have not had the headspace to try and imagine what that looks like in total, but maybe I can make some time with Jessica uh, to organize thoughts around that and like almost end up with a skeleton rather than try and create it from what we already have to have a little bit more intentioned. Um, and then the, other area that I've been working on is following up on the previous decentralized package manager um, research that I did, which is kind of coming towards some um, some thinking around how to make or 
one approach to make decentralized package management more resilient because if you have many and this would apply to it would even work for centralized package management as well and the idea is that for every registry that you depend upon for fetching information from uh if any one of those has availability issues either that something is deleted that is uh te temporarily down or broken or you're offline uh will actually cause problems if any one of them doesn't work your whole dependency resolution strategy fails because you need a piece of data from each one of those registries and with the the uh, advent of this github package registry every individual organization is its own registry there's not one giant registry there's many small ones each with their own little bits of dependency metadata and so i've been calling it a uh, resilient resolution and it's essentially saying if you take your rather than having three entities involved in a dependency um change let's say you've got your your application that has some dependencies you've got your uh the new dependency that you'd like to add and that could be an updated version or it could even be a removed version but let's say it's a it's just a new one that you want to add you currently need the registry as a third piece at least one registry potentially uh many more in the case of go ipfs you need 125 of them by my count uh for every different git repository that it references you can find that from go mod the go mod file in uh, the repository and if any one of those goes away obviously you you've broken that uh the ability to resolve that doesn't mean that well, you could have gone to Mars and then you're going to have to talk to 125 different uh, servers on Earth, which is uh, like, it's, it's just not going to work. So if you can take, if you can store more of the dependency information involved that was involved at the time that you did the previous resolution or that you published that package. So this is basically listing all of the possible acceptable versions of each one of the dependencies involved in this package has one dependency here are all the versions that it sees are acceptable at publish time this uh this application has a list of dependencies here are all the possible versions that can be used uh, can be accepted when successfully completing a dependency resolution but it usually only picks like say the latest one for example if you store all of that available version data, you don't need to go back to the registry to be able, in the case of a conflict or some other dependency satisfiability problem, I forget all of the terms around satisfiability, but then you're able to connect the dots between a new package and your application's dependencies without the registry, without needing extra information, which means that if you go offline, if you, uh, if you don't have that access because it was deleted or uh, is um, broken for some reason, you can still function, which means that in a decentralized world where there are registries popping up and disappearing all the time, you're basically saying like the first, when I actually see that registry, I'll take everything I need from it, I'll keep it locally, and then I'll be able to operate without it. Where it comes into IPFS land is like, then you're like, oh, actually, some of these problems become less problems because they're uh, always available for everyone who's sharing that content. But it, it means that you can still like lose uh, particular access to the network while still being able to work on what you have. So most of the way writing that up, I'm just kind of getting to the end and then we'll be published on the end of the previous issue, which then will be sucked out back into the docs directory once I finish um, circling around to organize that but it feels like it's I'd, I'd like to kind of get it out in front of a few more people and get their thoughts on it to see if it has some legs as a as an approach that would work uh it, i mean it definitely does work in cases like the homebrew or any kind of portable registry that stores everything locally so you don't need to go to the network to be able to do that um that's kind of uh where my head has been at basically for the past uh, four days 
um but hopefully get that published within the next day or two and then start getting some feedback on that as well that sounds super cool very cool I assume when um, when we're storing these things also, we're storing the CIDs of them so that we can also do this validation that, um, like for example, if, I, if I'm, I'm offline, but I find someone else who's offline who has an, an updated or, you know, so one of these options um, that I would like to use that I could also be like, oh, well, I have the metadata that points to your CID. So I know that the content that you have is something that would work with all of the other stuff that I'm trying to use without going back to a central registry. Yeah, so I've imagined, I've tried to not imply any kind of implementation to begin with, but when you add in IPLD, uh, kind of treating IPFS as, as the table store as, as like a done deal, this is like having key and table is very uh, reasonable and easy, Storing the, the data in IPLD would mean that you're even deduping like where we've got similar bits of dependency tree across many different packages. They're all referencing the same thing. It's actually like, oh, I've probably already got half of this dependency data in the registry bits I've already got locally before I need to go uh, out to the network to fetch stuff. Um, or if, as you say, like I'm connected to a local peer that has some of that, I don't need to... Uh, to do the work it it feels like there's a good proposal for any package manager and that implementing it on ipfs is the easiest way to do it uh, you could do it otherwise but if you use ipfs and ipld then you get like a um, boost from it or it's just easier to do the other thing that uh, i'm talking to eric although he's at he's in Berlin right now i think um and trying to find where how much this crosses over with his timeless stack work because it feels like it's kind of coming from the opposite angle. The timeless stack is all about how the end result ends up on your computer, but it currently skims all of the actual discovery of modules and catalogs and lineages. It basically just assumes that you already know where all the, those things are uh, and you don't you don't try and connect the dots. Um, whereas that's like the whole network effect of package managers is people sharing stuff and you being able to find it and then to be able to like resiliently use it uh, to actually get work done. Jim, did you have uh, some stuff? Um, yeah, I just put a bunch of stuff in. Um, uh, this week I... Uh, um, did some uh, brainstorming with you while I was in Portland and then I went to CSV Conf and I dropped a few interesting links into my notes there uh, and there was not much time to talk about them so um, I think uh, there was really interesting stuff at the conference the conference was mostly science science background academia people people and their interests are reproducibility and so having immutable packages is a big part of that there's a lot of work involved in actually packaging data which i wasn't really aware of um and uh also i met with uh jeffrey yaskin from the chrome team and learned a bit more about web package and uh, web package is actually intended for javascript so it's actually pretty relevant to the packaging discussions here so that's i can talk more about that uh if anybody's got questions Is there um, any more reading around that web package stuff than the repository? So webpack and web package are not the same thing. Cool. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, the branding on it's a little skeptical or <laughs> skeptical about the branding, but yeah, web web package is basically it's zip files basically okay. um, but it's they're going to be website all website so you can cache it offline yeah but they're all going to be um S using ssl certificates to sign that stuff and distribute them and their primary use case is peer-to-peer -peer. so 
Um, but this is coming from Chrome, which has like 80% browser share in the world. So um, maybe more than that. So. so I know that Chrome has, I think, I think Chrome has this idea of they, they cache a lot of common JavaScript. Maybe this is Cloudflare. Someone caches a lot of the common JavaScript libraries that many people use to make it more efficient for people to load websites. Is this ringing any bells for anyone? Um, if there's, someone Google. There's a web extension that does exactly that. But I don't know, maybe that's not what you're thinking. I thought there was like some, one of, one of the big guys, one of the big like central chunks of the internet like does, actually does this on the back end somewhere um, such that it serves really fast and you can load a lot, of, a lot of web pages really quickly. I think, yeah, it's like Google caches jQuery and all that stuff. Not related um, to AMP. Oh, yeah. I remember reading something about that. Chrome. Yeah, um, I think yeah, Google just recently uh, released a, a feature where they have like ES modules that are built into the browser, so you don't even have to fetch them off of the web. So I have a feeling that this probably fits into that plan. So this is a model whereby I visit a website, and we've talked about Companion doing this, right? But I visit a website and I cache everything I load in order to browse that website, I cache it offline in my IPFS node. And if I ever go to that website again, I'm like, oh wait, I already have all this data locally. I'll just load it locally. And if I want to refine that piece of text that I already saw, well, that's, that's great. You already loaded that. You don't need to do it again. You could do it even if you were offline. Um, is, is that pretty much what Web Packages is, is doing except without the IPFS part? Um, well, it doesn't really, so the only part that exists right now is the signed exchanges, which is being used by AMP, but AMP isn't the primary customer of this. So I think that they've been doing some work around like extending JavaScript. So JavaScript will actually have a standard library going forward, um, which will be, so I have a feeling that this will fit quite well with that. So they'll be able to upgrade the, the standard, standard library in the browser. Um, but by signing everything with SSL. Um, so, but I didn't really talk about that part with Jeffrey, so I'm just speculating. So. You guys have notes or something somewhere? It might be useful to, to share with the collab group um, so that at least, you know, I know that there are some people who talk to Chrome somewhat regularly, maybe not this person in particular, but integrating this into the, the total global conversation. Yeah, I, I believe um, that they're actually going to send a person to IPFS camp in Barcelona. So uh, we might be able to talk with them directly there. So. Perfect. We are out of time. Does anybody else have anything they want to discuss? I mean, I'd like to, to talk about MP and IPFS, but I think we should wait to see that after this call and we'll also stay on. Um, sure. Uh, the plan is the plan is to talk about NPM on IPFS from a more UX perspective slash what needs to happen before we're happy to release it with IPFS desktop. Um, but we're going to talk about that on the GUI call tomorrow. That sounds awesome. Cool. I will watch the recording because I won't be on a plane. But that sounds super snazzy. What time is that call, Ali? Uh, 4 p.m. in some time zones. <laughs> My time zone? Yes. My time zone. Okay, I can do um, that. It's on the community good. calendar. Um, yeah, I just want to get us all on a call and talk about, because we're very close to being able to push it out with desktop, but I think there's a bunch of things. There's some low-hanging fruit, and then there's bigger conversations about how do we make it really good? So we should do that. I'm going to start recording now. Yeah. See you all on the internet. Okay. <laughs>